Well, welcome everyone to the February edition of the second Friday lecture series. My name is Doug Dahman. I'm the educational coordinator here at the Civil War Museum in Kenosha, Wisconsin. With us today is Ranger Victoria Small from the um, National Park Service, the Re Reconstruction Era National Historic Park in South Carolina. We're so glad to have her with us today. And those of you who have uh, viewed these Second Friday lectures in the past know that this is something that we do on a monthly basis. Um, up until last March, we were offering these live and in person at our museum site. But like everyone else in the country, we've transitioned to our virtual platform. And we're, it's really allowed us to connect with historians and authors um, and people working in public history all over the country. So it's, it's a pleasure to welcome Victoria today. And as always, I, I would like to thank the um, Civil War Roundtable of Milwaukee and the Iron Brigade Association for being a longtime sponsor of our second Friday lecture program. So Victoria Small, uh, in fact, is new to the National Park Service. She became a park ranger this past September. She is Gullah Geechee native of St. Helena Island, South Carolina, where she formerly worked as the director of history, art, and culture at the Penn School National Historic Landmark District, known as the Penn Center. She is a former educator and museum director who, is currently, who currently serves her community as a Gullah Geechee cultural preservationist, artist, and public historian. I think I said that wrong the first time, uh, Victoria. I apologize for that, even though we went over this before we started. We're so glad to have you with us today. Um, and we were talking beforehand, it's probably better for you that you aren't here in Kenosha today dealing with our weather, um, but uh, we're glad we could connect over Zoom and uh, bring you here virtually. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be here with you today, Doug, and with the Civil War Museum. Thank you for the invitation to the National Park Service and the Reconstruction Era National Historical Park. I, um, you're right six degrees this morning there. Um, we're about 68 degrees currently here um, in beautiful South Carolina. Uh, um, however, um, I would love to come and visit one day and to visit the museum and your beautiful area. Looking well, you have an open invitation anytime. I would recommend between June and August. Um, but we really look forward to your program today. Um, the title of it is Reconstruction, a Revolution. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and turn off my camera and um, we'll pop back in at the end. So the floor is yours, Victoria. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you again. So we're going to be talking about reconstruction, um, the reconstruction era, and we're going to be talking about aspects of it um, on a lens, a national lens, and also a local lens here in Beaufort, and some aspects in your area. Um, so really, what is reconstruction? And the reconstruction era typically has had a timeline of taking place after the Civil War to about 1877. And national park um, historians and leading historians in the reconstruction era have expanded that timeline and really bringing it all the way to the beginning of the Civil War in 1861 and taking it through 1900, in some cases, even through 1901, 02, and 1903. And so what exactly is this era? And it's going to be a historic period in which the United States had to grapple with the question of how to integrate millions of newly free African Americans into the social, political, economic, and even labor systems here in the United States. So it's going to begin in November. Sometimes I, will, I would argue even earlier than that. But here in this area in Beaufort, South Carolina, um, in November 1861, the military forces of the United States captured the Sea Islands of South Carolina here in the Low Country. And the white residents in this area fled inland, leaving behind more than 10,000 enslaved people. By the following spring, soldiers, civilians, um, and people coming from all over, some refugees as well, launched the Port Royal Experiment, which was a series of policies towards education, military service, land redistribution and ownership, 
And all of these ideas are going to be coming together as foundations of the reconstruction. So I'm going to advance my slide a little bit here. And this is where we're talking. This is where I'm located here in South Carolina on the Atlantic coast. Um, you can see in the red square at the bottom, this is where we have our reconstruction in our national historical park. It was designated in 20, 2017 as a national monument and was redesignated in 2019 as a national historical park. So right here and within this square is going to be the area known as Beaufort County. Let's move forward. So you can see kind of where I'm located. Within our historical park, just to give you an idea about this park here, there's many national parks all over the United States, as we all know. And this is the one that's here in Beaufort. Within our park, we have, we have, um, the start at, on St. Helena Island with Daryl Hall and Brick Baptist Church. These two historic buildings are within the Penn School National Historic Landmark District. And these two, the Darrell Hall building is going to be actually one of our bases um, of the park um, on that campus. And Penn School, we're going to talk a little bit about the educational component during the Reconstruction era. But this site is significant because it was founded in 1862 during the Civil War. Just giving it a little introduction to that and what our park looks like. And then we also have Camp Saxton. We're all, we all know about how during the Civil War, there's different encampment sites for Union troops um, to gather to get ready to go off to war. So Camp Saxton is one of those sites and it's in the Port Royal town here in Beaufort County. This is gonna be where thousands of formerly enslaved people joined the United States Army during the Civil War and they're taking their steps into citizenship. So we're talking about education, at Penn School National Historic Landmark District and land ownership. We're at Camp Saxton, we're gonna talk about citizenship and land ownership, and then also the Emancipation Proclamation. And then at the old Buford Firehouse, this is gonna be within the Buford National Historic Landmark District. Much of Buford is designated as a historic landmark district because of the many historic homes and structures that are there that served as offices, hospitals, and homes to prominent figures during the Reconstruction era. And also some Black aristocracy, some formerly enslaved people that really catapulted within the higher echelons of that community. And we're also going to talk about a Civil War hero, Robert Smalls, within that realm, within that area. So this makes up our Reconstruction Era National Historical Park. And we hope that you will definitely come and visit our area. This image kind of just gives you a little snapshot of what is here in Beaufort, although we will be talking about more than just Beaufort, South Carolina. I talked about the Camp Saxton. We talked about um, the Emancipation Proclamation reading, um, the Brick Baptist Church, Robert Smalls in the center, well, at the bottom. And then also Freedman's Town, um, Mitchellville. It's going to be the first Freedman's Town in America established here um, within the Confederate, former Confederate South. <laughs> Thank you. And then also Penn School, as you can see. At the top, you'll recognize the, the young lady um, at the top, Miss Harriet Tubman. And she um, really had a prominent um, role here within the Civil War and as it pertains to Beaufort, South Carolina. So as I stated before, the timeline for reconstruction has expanded quite a bit. We're taking the reconstruction era all the way to the beginning of May 23rd, 1863. We know at this time that the fugitive slave law is intact. And during this time period, this is gonna be the first time period that the federal government, the union takes action towards um, um, taking on and helping people that are enslaved. So on May 23rd of 1861, you can see here, Major General Benjamin Butler, he refuses to return three fugitive slaves who seek shelter 
with the Union Army, and he's declaring them contraband of war. So of course, within war, um, forces that go into other areas will take things on as contraband of war, probably things like crops and fields or things that help sustain their forces, their armed forces. Here in Buford and other places, they'll take on buildings and houses to serve as headquarters, um, grounds um, and land to take be to serve as camps, encampment sites. Well, this is going to be the first time that the Union, um, the federal government decided they're going to take on these fugitive enslaved people as contraband of war. This is very significant. Also during this time, November through November 3rd through um, the, uh, November 9th, no, November 3rd through the 7th of 1861. As you can see here in this picture, this is the picture of the Atlantic Ocean. And this is the Port Royal area or what we call Beaufort County today in South Carolina. The Union forces are gonna come through with the, one of the largest fleets um, and form a U.S. Navy blockade in this area in the Port Royal Sound. They're also going to bring in U.S. Army, Army forces. They're capturing the Port Royal Sound because at, at that time, the Port Royal Sound was going to be one of the deepest waterways, um, which will enable the naval ships to come and set up this blockade. It also serves as a main artery within this very strong Confederate stronghold, this area of South Carolina. And also there's gonna be very valuable um, commodities, very valuable raw materials that are gonna be very necessary to help support the Union forces. One of the things that are very valuable at this time is gonna be the Sea Island crop, the Sea Island cotton crop, which is ready to be harvested at this time. So when the Union forces come into this blockade and then they have their, their, their water campaign, they soon enter into a land campaign. And this is where they are going to find um, and emancipate more than 1,000 enslaved people within this realm of the Port Royal District or Beaufort District, known as Beaufort County. So let's move on to the next slide. This is one of the images that um, from that time span that kind of shows a better depiction of the bombardment. Some of the bombardment is going to be taking place, of course, in Charleston at some time, a little bit later, Charleston, South Carolina. Another image from Harper's Weekly showing the Port Royal um, engagement with the Union blockade. This is going to be November 7th, 1861, um, Fort. Walker and Fort Beauregard. These are going to be in the Hilton Head Island area, still in the Port Royal Sound, the Port Royal Inlet here in South Carolina. This is kind of what it looks like today. You see all these different islands. All these areas are known as the Sea Islands. Historically, you'll hear um, within the newspaper articles of that time and primary sources talking about the Port Royal Sound, the Sea Islands, or the Beaufort District and all of this area and a little bit beyond that is gonna encompass that area. That's, this is where we are today. So, well, as I said before, when the Union forces came in and took over this area, they found more than 10,000 enslaved people. This is gonna be the time span where they're gonna take that May 23rd, 1861 example that General, Major General Butler made on taking on the three fugitive enslaved people as contraband of war. The federal government decides to expand that, um, that uh, practice into taking on these more than 10,000 enslaved people as contraband of war. What does that mean to them? This is gonna mean immediately that they are summarily um, emancipated, free. They're also going to be meeting with these individuals talking about how they will make their lives different, how they're going to all work together to advance their livelihoods through um, refugee camps, through education, through land ownership, through their most immediate needs first, through medicine and um, food and clothing, the things that are most urgent. 
during this time period also, there's gonna be a call of about 40,000 uh, volunteers coming that are gonna be coming from up north, abolitionists and missionaries that are gonna be called to help with this Port Royal experiment, it was called. And this is gonna test the capabilities of these newly freed people um, to be help that usher in to self-sufficiency, help within education, citizenship eventually, land ownership, all these different things, just to help organize the efforts. These people are going to be known as also within this area. We're within the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. That's what it's known as today. But this is a stretch of land that goes from Wilmington, North Carolina, down to St. Augustine, Florida, from the Atlantic coast to about 30 miles inland. And that stretch of land is going to be very significant during the war. It's going to be Sherman Special Field Orders number 15. And this stretch of land is where you have the quote unquote 40 acres in a mule that would be taking place with the land redistribution for people that are going to be free. In this area, it, it's going to happen a little bit differently as we talk about land ownership, and I will get to that very soon. One of, one of the prominent um, areas here is going to be the Smith Plantation on the Port Royal area in the Port Royal town. And this is also going to be where Camp Saxton um, would be first encampments here to help bring in the first South Carolina volunteers, the 33rd here in South Carolina, the Massachusetts 54th, Massachusetts 55th. Those two 54th and 55th are the regiments of, that are going to be really depicted. Actually, the Massachusetts 54th are going to be depicted in the movie Glory that we've seen with Matthew Broderick and uh, Morgan Freeman and Denzel Washington. The scenery from that movie when they are in camps before they march off to Fort Wagner is going to be right here at Camp Saxton in Beaufort. This picture is a very pretty well-known image in this area. You may have seen it before, but it represents five generations of people that are formerly enslaved and newly freed in this area. And it really speaks to how um, you have uh, generations after generations that are gonna really be able to benefit even um, today from the um, things that were put in place from the Reconstruction era. This is another image from this area, from St. Helena Island, and it really is going to speak to um, labor reform. So when the Union forces are coming through in 1861, and they come onto the land, their land campaign, and they find these 10,000 enslaved people, and this enormous amount of sea island crop that's in the field ready to be harvested, they still need people to, a workforce to pick this cotton. We don't have the, the machinery to go down into the fields to pick the cotton and to gin the cotton. You still needed the workforce by hand to pick this, this uh, sea island cotton, which is gonna be completely different from a regular staple cotton. Sea island cotton is gonna be a large bloom of cotton, longer fiber, more luxurious fi um, fibrous cotton that is really not um, used much in America, but primarily sent overseas to get more money for it. So these people are gonna be picking the Sea Island cotton, but for the first time ever, they're gonna get paid for it. So the union forces, Sea Island cotton actually, we back up Sea Island cotton for a planter for the enslavers, they can get anywhere from $7.25 to $11.25 at that time for a bale of cotton for 400 pounds of cotton. I would argue that the Union Forces didn't have that type of money to pay the contraband, the formerly enslaved people, that level of money, or maybe didn't see fit to give enslaved or newly freed people the contraband, that amount of money. So when the, the, the contraband would go into the fields to pick this cotton, they would get paid $1.25 around that amount for one bale of cotton, which is 400 pounds of cotton. That $1.25 is gonna be very instrumental, very important during the land distribution and tax sales that are gonna be happening 
that I'll talk about in a little bit. So I spoke about Camp Saxton. And Camp Saxton is going to, as I said, going to be very important within the war effort here. As I said, the, we're going to first bring in the first South Carolina volunteers, and, and Wisconsin is very familiar with volunteers during the Civil War. And the upper middle um, areas, the states that contribute greatly to the Civil War. So we have the first South Carolina volunteers that are going to serve at this site, as I said, later being renamed as a 33rd. Um, United States Colored Troops, and also the 54th and 55th, which are all going to be United States Colored Troops here at this site. Camp Saxton um, is actually also going to be a site where um, the Emancipation Proclamation is going to be read in 1863. What is also important about this site is the involvement of um, Citizen, what it means to be a citizen and serve in your country. We know that through, um, in 1857, the United States Supreme Court ruled in the Dred Scott case that people of African ancestry cannot be citizens of the United States. During the Civil War, the United States recruited Black soldiers into the ranks, including the first South Carolina volunteers at Camp Saxton on Port Royal. And in 1868 and 1870, the 14th and, 15, 14th and 15th Amendments were ratified, ratified and enshrining in citizenship for all those born in the nation and granting voting rights to African-American men. In places here, like in Beaufort County, Black voters were the majority. Throughout the Reconstruction era, formerly enslaved men like Robert Smalls, who we will talk to, talk about, represented their districts in state houses and in Congress. Another person that was very instrumental within bringing the United States Colored Troops in, of course, was Frederick Douglass. And he stated this, and I want to quote. Before I get to that quote, I wanted to just show you um, a newspaper clipping from Frank Leslie's illustration, um, and also what Camp Saxton kind of looks like today, very empty field. Today, it is um, one of our naval installations here in Beaufort, South Carolina. And also one of our sites within the National Park Service, within the Reconstruction and our National Historical Park. So this is gonna be the South Carolina, um, the 33rd United States Colored Troops. And this is what Frederick Douglass wanted to share about them in their service. Once, let the black man upon get upon his person the brass letter, U.S. Let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket. And there is no power on earth that can deny that he has earned the right to citizenship. This is a very, very powerful quote. And this is his argument to President Abraham Lincoln at this time that who better to serve in this, in this great fight for freedom than the people that the fight is for. So we also have a very important, another important prominent figure within the ranks here. She's gonna be brought on by the Union forces for her great work with the Underground Railroad. As we know, this is Harriet Tubman. And Harriet is so instrumental in the spring of 1862, Harriet decided to come down south to the Sea Islands to help alleviate the suffering of the people abruptly freed and in need of basic necessities of life. In Beaufort, Harriet served as a Union Army, served the Union Army in many capacities. She's going to be a scout, a spy, a nurse, and assisted in the recruitment of the U.S. Colored Troops, these Black soldiers. Um, she would infiltrate certain areas. When um, the Union forces came through, formed these Confederate uh, civilians, the white civilians fled the area. Many of them took some of what they could carry, and some of them took some of their enslaved people, some of their most valuable enslaved people. What makes the Gullah Geechee people so different from other African Americans in this area is that they've retained most of their Africanisms more than any other. Af uh, African-American in the United States. 
and they were brought over from West Africa, from the rice growing regions of West Africa to grow and cultivate rice. Sea Island, what is it? Uh, Carolina golden rice was a very profitable form of rice that was grown within that Gullah Geechee area that I talked about from North Carolina, Florida, along the coast. This area is gonna be very rich and vital to grow rice. And the West African people were gonna be stolen away, brought over because of their expertise of growing and cultivating rice. So some of these enslaved people were taken because they were so valuable and taken along with the enslavers to hide away during the Civil War. Harriet Tubman is gonna be a very skillful spy that's going to help infiltrate the, hide, the spaces and where they're hiding. And as we know within um, histories that she's not only had, had emancipated the people on the Underground Railroad, but she emancipated more than 700 people that were formerly enslaved and hidden away here in this area. She also ran an eating house in Beaufort, South Carolina. She established a wash house where she taught newly freed women to do washing, sewing, and baking for the Union soldiers so that they could become sufficient. So this is going to be where we're speaking about labor reforms during the Reconstruction era. On June 2nd, 1863, Harriet, under the command of the Union Colonel James Montgomery, became the first woman to lead a major military operation in the United States when she and 150 African-American Union soldiers rescued, as I said, 700 enslaved people on the Cumbi Ferry um, River Raid during the Civil War. Very, very um, important thing that's gonna take place here. I'm gonna scroll through for some of these images. We have a lot to cover, so I wanna make sure that I am getting everything. Um, this is our pictures and more. USCT, United States Colored Troops. So we also know about um, Charleston, South Carolina and how this is really gonna be um, a very important place that speaks to the Civil War in the beginning of it also. Um, a lot of people will think that only adult men are gonna be serving within the forces, the Union forces, but as you can see here, even children uh, are gonna be serving. They have their uniforms on. This is an image after the bombardment of um, onto Charleston, South Carolina. And you can see the catastrophe uh, behind um, in the background. I talk about Charleston, South Carolina and its significance during the war because of this man, Robert Smalls. So Robert Smalls here was born in Beaufort, South Carolina, and he was enslaved along with his mother, Lydia Polite. Um, Lydia Polite and Robert Smalls are going to be um, enslaved in a house in Beaufort, and his mother serves as a domestic within the house doing the, the household chores. And Robert is going to be growing up um, in a very unconventional way as an enslaved young child. He, he's going to be raised in the, um, in the plantation house with the plantation owners, with the children. Um, he's also going to adopt a, a stance of freedom unto himself very early on. And his mother becomes very concerned about this because he is an actual enslaved person. So she feared for his life. And she also feared that he could also be sold away somewhere else because he would not really abide by some of the, the rules that were set and laws that were set in place for him. So at age 12, his mother sent him, um, it was decided for him to go, not his mother didn't send him, but the enslavers sent him to Charleston, South Carolina to work as a stevedore to work on the Charleston Wharf. He had to carry along the slave tag, not this very one, but had to wear one in Charleston, South Carolina to identify enslaved people because they also had a small population of people um, that were free, people, colored people that were free or free people of color is what it should, I should say. So at age 12, he's gonna to go to Charleston, South Carolina. He's going to learn different tasks, primarily um, at age 17 and on, he's going to actually serve, not serve, 
be enslaved um, on the, uh, the planter steamship. And once the war begins in 1861, the steamship is commissioned to the Confederate States of the United States as a warship. So Robert is learning everything about the steamship. He's working very close with the captain. He's learning all the techniques. And then also he's not the only person of color um, that is learning these things, but he's primarily working close to the captain and really getting some valuable information. So when the war is going to start, the commands of the Confederate forces around Charleston had decided to abandon this area and because um, they were being overtaken and they redeploy the troops and weapons around the harbor. The planter had to pick up, um, as a Confederate steamship, had to pick up a shipment of four large cannons from a nearby island. This is gonna be very valuable later on. The Confederates were a little behind schedule um, during this time period. I'm gonna move forward and advance in this slide so we can get on the right page. And this is where we wanna be. And so they were a little behind schedule and this is gonna be Tuesday, May the 12th of 1862. Um, so they decided that they would dock and get um, just recuperate. Uh, even though they were a little behind schedule, they needed to get some rest. The, the crew was, the planner crew was really looking forward to a quiet, relaxing night after they had two weeks of um, constant duty orders. The captain of that ship, along with the crewmates, which were Confederate soldiers, they decided to enjoy a night ashore. And Robert Smalls and the other crew decided that they needed to get busy and make a plan. Actually, they started making a plan before that night. And the plans for the escape required the crew to smuggle food. And I'm talking about this crew of enslaved people that are on the, on the planter. They smuggled on food, water, aboard the planter to get ready for this escape that's gonna happen on May 13th, 1863 which is known as the seizure of the planter. They would watch the enslaved men, they would watch for an opening when the white military Confederate crew would be absent from the ship so it could be confiscated without undue turmoil. And those who would escape to freedom would be, go here, would be these men along with their, a few more. Um, and this is a picture of what the planner looked like at that time. And so the crew were Robert Smalls, who was the wheelman, wheelman, John Smalls, which, who was the first mate, Alfred Gladeen, Samuel Chisholm, Abraham Alston, Gabriel Turno, Abraham Jackson. And they also went and decided to pick up their family members. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, about 11 other family members to steal away to freedom. So the planner had picked up um, some of their family men members, the, ensl the enslaved crew picked up some of their family members at about 3 a.m. in the morning on May the 13th. And they, as you can see in the previous slide, the planter is all the way down at the bottom right. The red line shows their route through all of these different Fort Sumter, um, Fort Beauregard, Fort Moultrie, and you see all of these battery cannons that if they even knew that it was enslaved people stealing away, they would have been totally bombarded or not totally bombarding this ship, but capturing them and doing the worst um, that could be imagined. So the crew, the enslaved crew decided that if they would not be caught, that they would line the ship with dynamite or some explosives to blow the ship up, knowing that they could all very well die in this escape to freedom. They felt that it was well worth it to, um, to, to help in the war effort, to free themselves and their family members rather than to be enslaved. So as they're going out of the Charleston Harbor, there is this fleet this naval blockade and they are in a confederate steamship and the the plan was masterful the whole entire crew and family members were part of this great escape even robert smalls's wife planned having a white sheet folded up folded up in her backpack um, to raise to lower the the flag that was on the confederate steamship and to raise the surrender white sheet 
to to prove that they were um, not the enemy. We're going to advance. So this great escape is going to be known throughout the country. This is going to catapult um, the crew and especially Robert Smalls, who served as and pretended to be the captain of the steamship during this escape, is going to catapult them into, into fame. Um, it's very important to know that they are enslaved people. They are stealing away. And during this time, also, the, the, the union um, awards, gives monetary awards for this type of bravery, to be, um, delivering such a vessel to the, um, from the enemy to the union forces. And there is a sizable reward that is typically given to white citizens um, for this type of act. However, the union forces didn't see fit to give the full reward um, for this bravery, but they did give something very significant to Robert Smalls. With that, he received a war prize of $1,500 from the government uh, for turning over the planner. He also was taken on and served as, um, he was piloting the planner for the Union, for the government, even during the Civil War, making several expeditions and during in-service after the war until the ship was decommissioned. He served in many capacities. The, the money he got from the planter, the money that he received at, for a piloting, being a captain during the war, and then after the war on the steamship, really raised him, made him into a wealthy man by most standards, not just by white standards, by most standards during this time period. He's going to decide to come back to Beaufort, South Carolina after the war. And he's going to become an entrepreneur. He's going to buy the home in which he was enslaved in. He and his mother was enslaved in. He's also going to own a mercantile store. He's going to jo jointly own a steamboat um, rental commercial service. He's gonna own a horse-drawn um, buggy taxi service. And he's also gonna be the publisher of the Beaufort uh, of a colored newspaper here, the, the Southern Standard. He buys about nine properties for himself and his family and as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, very wealthy. Move forward. And this is, these are images of Robert Smalls after, of course, um, his catapult into fame. This fame is going to catapult him in such a way that he's able to enter into, because of these amendments that are coming forward in the Reconstruction era, and the Black um, majority that was here within these areas, um, where enslaved people outnumber the enslavers, where um, when the time came to vote, um, they were able to vote people that represented them in their causes, in their needs. And these are going to be the first colored senators and representatives here um, in the United States Congress. And here in the state of South Carolina, there are about 400,000 Blacks to 250 Whites. So Beaufort County, this area is about 80% Black. So they were able to elect these, these gentlemen into office. Robert Smalls is gonna be instrumental um, within the school district. He's gonna put forth legislation for the first black public school in 1867. He's gonna be instrumental in the formation of the Republican party in, in the South Carolina state in 1868. He's gonna serve, become a delegate six more national um, conventions. He's going to be a delegate of South Carolina uh, in the Congress, in the Senate. And in 1867, Robert Smalls is going to begin his career as a United States congressman, serving five terms from 1860, 1875 to 1886. Very significant. This is the home in which he bought, 511 Prince Street, where his mother and him, he were enslaved. It is stated that um, after the war was over, uh, Mrs. McKee, who was his enslaver, uh, was very distraught after the war. And um, coming back um, to this house, thinking that it is still hers, um, she entered into the house and Robert Smalls and his family welcomed her 
took care of her, took pity on her that she was not in her right mind and allowed her to stay in this house with them. How was it even possible that he could even buy land? And this speaks to what took place during the Civil War um, and after the Civil War with land redistribution and the selling of land at tax sales. So when the Union forces came through in 1861 and there was this great skedaddle of white, or white planners that are gonna be fleeing this area, they're not gonna support the Union government and pay their taxes. Some of them are not, some of them do. The Confederate states say that if you pay your federal taxes to the Union army, we're gonna imprison you. Thank goodness they were too busy with the war effort to really imprison anyone paying their taxes. The Union said that was here, they said, if you do not pay your property taxes to us, we're going to take your land and we will sell, sell it at property tax sales. The Union Army, also, the federal government also stated that the people that would have the first opportunity to buy that land would be the people who were enslaved on that land. This is going to be a lot different from the 40 acres distribution of land that would be rescinded and taken away from free people um, after the war. So anyone that's gonna be purchasing their land during this property tax sales by law own this land. So Robert Smalls um, is going to serve in a, such an amazing way in many different capacities also. Okay, <laughs> pardon me. And he unfortunately lives this wonderful, amazing, um, life of contribution and service. And he's gonna die in 1915. One of the quotes I really must have to read about him is this one that he was very well known for that he made um, November 1, 1895. And he states, my race needs no special defense for the past history of them in this country proves them to be the equal of any people anywhere. All they need is an equal chance in the battle of life. It's one of my favorite quotes. So we're gonna move forward a little bit more and we're gonna talk about contributions of other places to um, the reconstruction um, era and to the civil war. So we already talked about um, on May 23rd, 1861 at Fort Monroe. This is gonna be where the General Major Butler, um, Major General Benjamin Butler takes on the three fugitive enslaved people as contraband of war. So that's gonna be in Virginia. And then we're going to see, um, then we're also gonna see the District of Columbia throughout the South where the Civil War was being raged. They're going to be um, holding Congresses um, to help abolish um, Slavery, and this is going to be 1816. No, I'm sorry, April 16, 1861. Congress abolishes the slavery in the District of Columbia with compensation to loyal owners. So, if you're going to be become loyal to the Union again, then you can get compensated for your loss of enslaved people. Another place that, which is going to be really um, important is in New, New Orleans in August 22nd. Major General Benjamin Butler, again, he incorporates into the U.S. forces several National Guard units composed of three Black soldiers. Soon after, he begins recruiting both free Black and ex-formerly enslaved men for additional regiments. Moving forward, you can see in Syracuse, New York, where Black leaders at the convention in October of 1864 they gather in Syracuse to form the National Equal Rights League and call for the creation of state and local organizations to press for civil rights. In 1865, in January, you also see, um, as I stated, Major General William um, Sherman Special Field Orders Number 15. He confiscates 40, 400,000 acres of land along the Atlantic coast. South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, that Gullah Geechee corridor, that same stretch of land, to be divided into 40 acre parcels distributed to 18,000 free enslaved families, formerly enslaved families. African American families begin 
um, constructing their own farms, rebuilding communities shattered by slavery and war. In the fall of 1865, unfortunately, President Andrew Johnson, Johnson undermines this order, returning the land to its former enslaved, in, um, former owners. This is gonna be vital. All of this is very vital and really speaks to how the reconstruction era is happening all throughout. You can even see in um, 1869 in February, of course, Congress is gonna pass the 14th amendment, barring states from excluding voters based on the race or previous condition of inservitude. And this is what enables people to be able to vote formerly enslaved, newly freed people are gonna be able to vote um, for their representation. Another thing I thought was really interesting, going back to 1866, the US Army forms the 9th and 10th Colored Cavalry Regiment to be stationed in the Western territories. And these black soldiers are called Buffalo soldiers by the indigenous Native American people. Also during this time span of reconstruction, going well beyond 1865, as you see here, um, you're gonna have the forming of historical black colleges and universities. You're gonna have the forming of the Freedmen's Bureau, which is gonna be very vital. And then also, even there are significant contributions and participation during the Civil War, which comes from the upper middle west of the United States to include areas like Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Ohio, Michigan, Minnesota, and of course, Wisconsin. And set well over one million men who served in Union forces against the Confederate States of America not only providing soldiers, but doctors and other military war personnel, but also raw materials and food that were necessary for the war to help sustain the effort, the war effort. Mid to late 1861, there's evidence of Wisconsin's significant contribution during the war with the, the enlistment of Wisconsin's volunteers and enlisted troops to the end of the war. And of course, the Civil War Museum in Kenosha uh, provides excellent primary sources and interpretation of the contributions and sacrifices made here. Let's move forward. So another very important thing about um, the Reconstruction era is education. So, um, of course, it's going to be against the law. <laughs> Prior to the Civil War, during the Civil War, um, in many places, it's against the law to teach enslaved people. However, when the Union forces came through here and emancipated the people, it set this tone and foundation for many things to take place. And as you can see here, this is going to be the first day of school, June 18, 1862. And it's going to be called, it's not called yet the Peace School House. Um, the Penn School, but this is going to be Oaks Plantation House where the first class is going to take place for Penn School. And there are these two women that come from um, Pennsylvania. One is Laura Town. She is a missionary and abolitionist trained in homeopathic medicine and education. And she's going to come in 1862 with the under the protection of the federal union forces that are here. And she's going to start a school with nine scholars along with Ellen Murray, who is also coming from up north. Ellen Murray is going to come from Turkish immigrants, and she is going to be trained in education. These two ladies start the Penn School inside of this building. This is what it looks like today, the Oaks Plantation House. This is going to serve as a union quarters on St. Helena Island, where I am from. And the officers allow um, Laura Town and Ella Murray to start in the pantry area of the house with nine scholars. I say scholars because this is the words that they used in their letters and diary, journal entries. Um, they called the students scholars. So imagine being called a slave, then being called the contraband, then being catapulted to scholar. And they gave about 40 years of their lives each to the education and betterment of the people in the Sea Islands. So the class sizes are gonna grow so fast that they get kicked out of the Oaks Plantation House and they started having using the grounds in a central area on St. Helena Island. Um, and this is one image from the Penn School with first graders. And then they're gonna to move to Brick Baptist Church 
this church is going to be built in 1855 by the enslaved people for the planters, for the enslavers. One great thing about this church is that the plantation owners are going to allow the enslaved population, if they could get to this church during worship service, they're going to um, participate in quietly, out of sight, out of mind, in the balcony area of the church where the white congregation would sit on the first level of the church. The, when the Union forces come through, there are no white um, planters on the island. So when the school was um, being rethought and looked at for larger space, this church has been served as a school site from 1862 to 1864, 1865. And they start their school day, first day off in here with 80 scholars. This is a newspaper rendering from that time period within the church was sharing about um, what would be taking place. You'll see a lot of accounts within um, news journals, newspapers, um, historian accounts of um, the teachers in the Sea Islands and the, um, the contraband, the newly freed people and what is happening in the war effort here. We have to remember that this is still in the midst of the Civil War. And the third um, person that's gonna come down and help at the school is gonna be a free person of color for several generations coming from Philadelphia and Boston area. This is Charlotte Fortin. She, her married name is Charlotte Fortin Grimke. And she's coming from an upper middle class family. Her grandfather is gonna be pretty wealthy. And she decides she's trained um, as an educator, but she's a prolific writer. And she, we're very thankful for her accounts and her journal entries and letters and newspaper articles depicting what life was like for her in the South and teaching within the Brick Baptist Church at Penn School. Another rendering from that time span depicting young children and adults attending the Penn School. This is what the Brick Baptist Church looks like today. It is an active congregation and also one of the sites that is a national monument to the Reconstruction era. So soon after, in about 1864, the freedmen of the island decided that they wanted to take this church on as a house of worship and inform the founders of the school that they would be kind of removed from the site. So they had a wonderful plan to, this is one of Charlotte Fortin's books, pardon me, and how we are able to know so many wonderful things about the Penn School and her activities in education here. She wrote specifically about the Emancipation Proclamation reading, January 1, 1863, at the Camp Saxton that we talked about earlier. This place is gonna be where whites and blacks, everyone is converging. The, the people that served within, within the war effort, they're coming and they're hearing one of the official readings of the Emancipation Proclamation. Charlotte Fortin gives one of the most beautiful accounts of January 1, 1863 within her writings. So as I was starting to get to is that um, when they were removed from the school building, the school was removed from Brick Baptist Church, there was another gentleman by the name of Hastings Gant who became, who amassed a lot of land, purchased a lot of land during those tax sales um, that um, where the land was um, taken away from people who did not pay their property taxes. Uh, Hastings Gant brought a lot of land. However, what he did with, is so significant is that he donated and sold 50 acres of land to the founders of the school, Laura Town and Ellen Murray, so that they could bring this schoolhouse from up north. This schoolhouse was made in three parts, shipped down the Atlantic Coastal Waterway, put together. It's going to be the first prefabricated building that we know of in North America. Surely the United States, but this is what was um, shared within the newspaper articles. Because he donated and sold this 50 acres of land, they were able to place this schoolhouse there along with other buildings that are going to be popping up throughout the, throughout the history of the school. 
So this represents the 50 acre National Historic Landmark District of Penn School. It's known as Penn Center today. Um, you see that Daryl Hall is up there in the upper left hand corner. And along the St. Helena Road, the Martin Luther King Road is the Brook Baptist Church. And they also had the first school building, which is no longer on that campus. But all of these buildings speak to the history of the Penn School, to education, to land redistribution and ownership uh, within the reconstruction era. This is Daryl Hall on the campus. This is where I'm stationed, not today, but this is where I'm typically stationed um, for the National Park Service here. And it was also used as a meeting place for the schools, a gymnasium meeting space um, for temperance meetings, um, graduations would be held here, all a host of different things for community meetings as well. I have to go pretty quickly because I'm running out of town time, but I want to talk about the Freedmen's Bureau. And this is going to be really significant because the Freedmen's Bureau is going to be adding more protections to the freed people um, during the Civil War. And they're going to be in place to provide food, clothing, education, job training, and to help with the land and also banking system. So when United States colored troops became, got their pensions payments, they didn't, there were no banking systems um, set up for these people. And so they had to um, not only provide protection, the freedom of had to provide protection because also the former landowners, plantation owners are coming back after, you know, at some parts of the war, coming back to their land and houses to find that their land and houses no longer belong, belongs to them anymore. So the Freedmen's Bureau does add protection for that. Going back to the banking system, when United, like I said, there were people that were involved in the war effort that were colored United States color troops or civilian workers, they would get checks or pension checks. They needed a banking system to put their money into. It also would be a savings and loan. This would also be a place where they could go and find out what lands were available to purchase that were delinquent tax land um, and that it, they could do that. So it read here on March 3rd, Congress creates the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen and Abandoned Lands known as Freedmen's Bureau, which grants its agents authority to regulate labor contracts, distri distribute rations, encourage the development of schools and hospitals, it also authorizes distribution of not more than 40 acres of confiscated land to all loyal freedmen and refugees. So refugees could also be um, whites that are coming back to the area. And also refugees are also meaning uh, enslaved people that fled areas that were still, in, they were still enslaved and came to the Beaufort area so that they can experience freedom sooner. So many families and people in this area actually still own the land in which they purchased during the 1860 tax sales. Um, this is what the Freedmen's Bank looks like today. It's in the heart of downtown Beaufort Historic District. It's an actual a retail store now, but the store still stands and it has a historic marker that is placed there. As I said, one of the people that benefited from this is going to be Hastings Gant. This is his Freedmen's Bureau bank application, a portion of it, and this is him. He's also gonna serve in the South Carolina legislature at the same time Robert Small serves. So he is also pretty wealthy in, in terms of money, land ownership, and then also being able to serve within um, the community, his, within the um, South Carolina legislature. This is a picture is not my family, but it represents my second great grandparents. Adam Smalls is my, is my second great grandfather, and he was married to Betsy Smalls. And on February 9, 1869, they opened up a Freedmen's Bank account at that Freedmen's um, Bank in Beaufort. He was about 30 years old. You can see that here. He's not sure. It says where he lives, where he resides, where he was born. His occupation is farmer. He was a sea island cotton farmer. And it says here, works for himself on his own land. 
Then it was his children. His father's name is Sancho. His mother is Afi. This is all of my family here represented. Not only did he have money to put in the bank, he also, they also owned 59 acres of land, which we own 20 of still today. So the Reconstruction era did have some hardships, a lot of hardships. And there was you know, proof of the dismantling um, of the Reconstruction and all of the progress that was made. Some of that has been taken back. But you have people that still own their land today. And then you also have places like the Penn School that still exist today that came out of that Port Royal experiment that came out of the Reconstruction era. We have a lot of laws, amendments that are put in place and some that are, are still being challenged today. So one of the things about the end of Reconstruction that I wanna to talk to you about as I wind down is that in many Southern states, supporters of the former Confederacy resisted Reconstruction era policies intended to promote education, citizenship, land ownership, for formerly enslaved people. They organized groups like the Red Shirts to wage war, a wage a campaign of violence and terror against black citizens, and Northerners who had moved to the South to assist the freedmen. By 1867, the campaign of terror had achieved its goal. And in most places, Southern white Democrats regained control of local and state governments, ousting people like Robert Smalls and Hastings Gannett and all most all of the uh, black political leadership that was put in place. Utilizing a clause of the 13th amendment that permitted slavery as punishment for a crime, these redeemers, as they were called, passed laws designed to incarcerate black people and enforce a rigid segregation system known as Jim Crow. By 1900, Jim Crow laws had undone the gains of reconstruction marking the end of the Reconstruction era. That really is very unfortunate. Um, that is all that I have for you today. I really wanna be able to engage fully and more about the Reconstruction era. I know that you all will have some questions about it. I do wanna recommend um, this handbook. And it's the Reconstruction era is put out by the National Park Service. Um, through Easton National. And it's a really great um, guideline that I give teachers, um, cultural and historical places. I, I give this to them as a resource to really talk about the different accounts and how the National Park Service has come up with this new expanded timeline about Reconstruction Era. So Doug, the Civil War Museum, I, I really wanna appreciate you all for letting me go over my time. <laughs> And um, you may have to edit this down to suit your needs, but I'm really, really grateful to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. You're incredibly interesting. I hope that um, our viewers got a great sense of what the National Park Service is doing in your area. I hope for me personally, it'd be a great place to come down and visit to see the Port Royal District, Beaufort, all of the, the different places you talked about, so rich with Civil War history, and then how the timeline of Reconstruction, how it's been moved forward, like you said, um, very educational to see how these major players in Reconstruction and these events all took place in this one area of South Carolina, I think is incredible. One, thank you for that, Doug. I really appreciate that. One thing I do want to invite um, your participants, um, anyone participating, is to visit um, our website which is um, nps.gov um, slash r-e-e-r, -E -E rare. And this is gonna take you to our website. And also one thing I wanted to just mention is that now we have a Reconstruction Era National Historic Network where we are bringing in different sites from across the nation into this network because we know that Reconstruction didn't just happen in specific places that the country as a whole, even the Western Territory, had contributions. Um, places like Wisconsin had major contributions. So this is the way that we could tell a more fuller story. So I stop, I thank you again. Thank yeah, you good so luck. much. Good luck with the project and the new park and the interpretation. And I'm sure we'll be talking to you again in the future. Take good care. Thank you so much.